That's good. Good morning. It's my pleasure to call this meeting of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to order. Today is Wednesday, January 25th, 2023. The time is 9.31 a.m. With us today are Commissioners Emily Lindley and Bobby Janeka, as well as our General Counsel, Mary Smith, and I am John Nearman. For those who are joining us virtually today, please remember to keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking. For those who are making presentations, please wait until our General Counsel or I have asked you to begin speaking. On items where argument or discussion is allowed, we will inform speakers of their time limits. Registration has now closed, but if you'd like to address the commission on a particular item, please email agenda at tceq.texas.gov with your name, your affiliation, and the item you'd like to comment on, and we will do our best to accommodate that request. With that, Ms. Smith, um, I'll ask you to please call the first item. Item number one is the consideration of the proposal for decision and proposed order concerning the executive director's denial of the application by Michael Cook for an on-site sewage facility apprentice license. The parties have been notified that the order of presentation will be the applicant, the ED, and then OPIC, and that each party will have five minutes of oral argument time. The applicant may reserve a portion of his time for rebuttal as he bears the burden of proof. Um, and so with that, we will begin with the applicant, Mr. Michael Cook, who I'll just say um, we have not received a registration for him um, being in the um, room today in person or online. Okay. Uh, M Mr. Cook, are you present in the room or are you with us online by any chance? Tell you what, let's proceed with the... Uh, um, the presentations and uh, we'll return to him and see if he has an opportunity to join us. So that would bring us to the executive director. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, com um, Commissioners, General Counsel, Public Interest Counsel. My name is Alicia Ramirez and with me is Ms. Hi Haya Zeman, PE, Deputy Director of the Occupational Licensing and Registration Division. We represent the Executive Director in this matter. The ED agrees with the Administrative Law Judge's proposal for decision and proposed order and recommends that the Commission adopt them. We are available for any questions. I have none. Colleagues, any questions? No, thank you. No, All right, let's hear next from OPIC. Uh, good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. For the record, I'm Garrett Arthur, TCEQ Public Interest Counsel. As stated in our closing, OPIC agrees with the EDs and ALJ's conclusion that denial of Mr. Cook's OSSF apprentice, apprentice license application is appropriate on two grounds. First, he committed a sexually violent offense pursuant to Texas Occupational Code Section 53.021A3. Second, the record shows that the offense directly relates to the duties and responsibilities of the licensed occupation pursuant to TOC section 53.021A1. OPIC further notes that Mr. Cook failed to disclose an additional conviction in Washington State on his initial application and failed to provide any evidence of rehabilitation outside of his own testimony. For these reasons, OPIC agrees with the ALJ's findings and conclusions and respectfully recommends the Commission adopt the PFD as presented. Thank you, and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. Um, I don't think I have any questions right now. Colleagues, any questions? No. Okay. Um, well, colleagues, let me share a few observations. You know, we'll, we'll note that the applicant does have a solid work history. He's a father. He's a provider for his family. He does seem to be working to better himself. All that's positive. We're happy to see that. Um, unfortunately, we're meeting him in the context of a very serious criminal history and while time has passed and he served a sentence and um, there's evidence that he completed counseling maybe that was just on his own testimony um, he is still deemed to pose a, a moderate risk and so um, I'm uncomfortable overruling the judge uh, based based on that risk um, so um, you know what I failed to do is I failed to check one more time if Mr. Cook has had an opportunity to return to us. So let me let me do that and then I'll conclude my my thoughts. M Mr. Cook, have you been able to join us by any chance? Okay, I thought that was the case. If if he if 
<laughs> Mr. Cook, if you happen to return to this agenda and you ever watch this, let me just say that I'm not suggesting a permanent bar. If you, um, um, if the registry ever downgrades your risk and you're able to uh, uh, come to us with letters of recommendation, we, we could consider a new application and take a fresh look at this. But um, the facts as they are, I'm, I'm not ready to, to uh, make any changes to the ALJ's proposal. Um, other than the following, um, I think that it would be more appropriate to refer to uh, Mr. Cook as the applicant rather than the respondent. Um, I would strike the reference, and this is in finding of fact 10, to the applicant's age at the time of the first degree felony, and I would correct conclusion of law 8 to identify the appropriate apprentice license. Um, so those are, those are my suggestions. Commissioner Lindley? I, I'm in a, a complete agreement. I don't really have anything to add on. Commissioner Janeka? Um, I'm likewise in agreement and will only uh, ditto your, your comment on the suggested change from respondent to applicant. I think that's entirely appropriate. Uh, the, the difference may not seem much to the ear of the public, but for those of us in this space, respondent is uh, typically someone who's committed some action that becomes a respondent. So thank you for that change. I think we're ready for a motion. Um, I've, I've got one. <clears throat> I would move that we adopt the administrative law judge's proposed order, but correct conclusion of law eight to reference an on-site sewage facility apprentice license instead of a water system operator's license to correct an apparent clerical error. That we also correct the references to respondent and finding of, findings of fact five and seven to state applicant because Mr. Cook is an applicant for a license rather than a respondent to an enforcement proceeding and that we delete the first sentence of finding of fact 10 because it, does, because it is not clearly established by the record. I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Item number two is the application by Dos Republicas Coal Partnership for Renewal of Texas Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit Number WQ00035110000. The parties have been notified that the commissioners will not take oral argument but may ask questions, and those who have signed in will be noted for the record. Colleagues, um, really without belaboring the issue, I agree with the executive director and OPIC that the uh, requesters have not raised sufficient new evidence or argument to warrant reconsideration. Um, I'll note that TCEQ's permit differs from the Railroad Commission's permit, but it is not in conflict with it. Um, we have captured all of the discharge points in this reclamation phase. The court has answered the question about anti-degradation and this renewal is is even more stringent than what the court had considered so i'm inclined to deny the request and issue the renewal i'm in agreement well said i have a motion um i would move that we deny all requests for reconsideration issue the renewal of tpdes permit number wq 00035110000 to dos republicas coal partnership as recommended by the executive director and adopt the executive director's response to comments I second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Item number three is the consideration of the petition filed by Pitt Creek Ranch LLC for the creation of Lampasas County Municipal Utility District number one. The parties have been notified that the commissioners will not take oral argument but may ask questions and those who have signed in will be noted for the record. Colleagues, as you know, we review requests for contested case hearings on mud creations under Chapter 55, subchapter G, so we are, we are looking for affected persons, and that is uh, requesters, requesters who have identified a personal justiciable interest 
and the word justiciable refers to what's within the commission's authority on this item. And for a mud creation, what's justiciable is whether the mud is feasible, practical, and would benefit the land. And that includes questions about the availability of comparable services from other systems, as well as um, economic feasibility. And importantly, it includes the effect to land with respect to seven factors that are laid out at Texas Water Code Section 54.021B3. And those include groundwater levels and recharge, drainage, water quality, and subsidence, among other factors. Um, further, in analyzing the effects to land, the commission considers both the proposed district as well as uh, nearby properties that may be affected. And importantly, we cannot consider um, factors outside this framework. So for example, we cannot consider noise or traffic or property values. These are not justiciable issues in the context of a MUD petition, even though they very, they very well may be legitimate concerns. On this item, we have what I would describe as three requests representing a total of about two dozen requesters. The first requester um, is the Lampasas County Water Control and Improvement District number one. It's raised concerns about drainage in connection with its flood control responsibility within the Sulphur Creek watershed, including with respect to its easement within the proposed mud. So I believe that Lampasas County WCID is an affected person and would grant its request. The second request is by what I'll call the joint landowners. And it's a joint request um, by 18 individuals who have raised concerns about drainage, subsidence, water quality, and the availability of comparable services. And these, of course, are all justiciable um, issues, interests. Um, However, some of those 18 requesters are, in my view, too far from the proposed MUD to be considered affected persons who have concerns that are different from the general public. So I would only grant the joint landowners requests as to some of the requesters, and, uh, and those are the Bates, the Mings, the Smiths, the Taylors, the Watsons, Richard Andrew, and Janet Mackin. Um, all of whom are in close proximity to the proposed MUD. And the, the third and final request is another joint request um, by individuals associated with the WCM Ranch. Uh, this request states that the WCM Ranch is adjacent to the proposed MUD, um, which is certainly close enough, and it raises concerns about water quality and groundwater. So we have both proximity and justiciable interests, um, and, and so I think that these are affected persons, and I would grant their requests. Commissioner Lindley, that's, that's how I see it. Um, I believe you said the Taylors, Randall and Mary Joyce Taylor, uh, that you I recommended did. granting them. I just want to double check. Okay. That was one I want to make sure I heard. Um, I, I'm in agreement. Likewise. All right, sounds like we may be ready for a motion on this as well. I'll give it a shot. I would move that we grant the following hearing requests. The Lampasas County Water Control and Improvement District Number One. Uh, Carly Ann Goen, uh, Goen, maybe is the better way to say that? Burton William Rawson Goen, Morgan Goen Caldas, Suzanne Smith Rush, Richard Andrews, Tasha and Billy Gates, Janet Mackin, Craig and Stacy Mings, Sharon and Ronnie Smith, Randall and Mary Joyce Taylor, and Thomas Watson and Jane Toll Watson, and that we de deny all the remaining hearing requests, and that we refer the matter to SOA for a contested case hearing on the petition. I second the motion. Can I um, just make sure that I heard something correctly? Tasha and Billy Bates, is that? I thought I might have yes, heard Gates. I, I, uh, Bates. Bates. I might have said Gates, but I do mean Tasha and Billy Bates. Thank you. I heard Bates. <laughs> the closer you get, the clearer I am. I was <laughs> expecting to hear Bates, perhaps. <laughs> There's a, a tinge of gate on this, Gates on this side of the, the, something in the room acoustics. I said, still second the motion. All right. Uh, the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Uh, 
Item number four is the consideration for approval to publish and solicit comment on the draft implementation plan for four draft total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria in tributaries of the Natchez River below Lake Palestine. The executive director's staff is here to present this item. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. For the record, I am Nicole Hall with the Water Quality Planning Division in the Office of Water. With me today are Nicole Reed with the Total Maximum Daily Load Program and Bobby Salahi with the Environmental Law Division. Today, the Executive Director is requesting the release for public comment of the implementation plan for four total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria in tributaries of the Neches River below Lake Palestine. The TMDLs cover four assessment units and four water bodies within Angelina County. A stakeholder group was formed with balanced representation of all interested parties and was tasked with providing input on the I-Plan document. The development of this document included an active public participation effort and balanced stakeholder group coordinated by TCEQ and the Texas Water Resources Institute. The success of this project is due to the collaborative effort of the individuals and organizations that put in the time to develop this document to improve water quality in their community. The executive director respectfully requests approval to publish the implementation plan for public comment. Permission is also requested to make non-substantive and clerical corrections before providing the document for public notice. Thank you and we are available to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. I have none. Colleagues, any no. questions? Seeing none. Ms. Smith, has anybody signed in to speak? No. Mr. Arthur. OPIC supports publication of the draft implementation plan. I do too. Thank you. Um, as usual, we appreciate all the stakeholder involvement. This, um, I think we're ready to put this out for comment. I will make the motion that we approve the publication of and solicitation of public comment on the draft implementation plan for four draft total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria and tributaries of the Neches River below Lake Palestine as recommended by the executive director. I second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Item number five is the consideration for approval to publish and solicit comment on the draft implementation plan for five total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria in Hillebrandt Bio and Neches River Tidal in the Neches Trinity Coastal Basin and the Neches River Basin. The executive director's staff is here to present this item. Good morning again. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. For the record, I am Nicole Hall with the Water Quality Planning Division in the Office of Water. With me today are Nicole Reed with the Total Maximum Daily Load Program and Bobby Salahi with the Environmental Law Division. Today, the Executive Director is requesting the release for public comment of the implementation plan for five total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria in Hildebrandt Bayou and Neches River Tidal. The TMDLs cover five assessment units and two water bodies within Jasper, Jefferson, and Orange Counties. A stakeholder group was formed with balanced representation of all interested parties and was tasked with providing input on the I-Plan document. The development of this document included an active public participation effort and balanced stakeholder group coordinated by TCEQ and the Texas Water Resources Institute. The success of this project is due to the collaborative effort of the individuals and organizations that put in the time to develop this document to improve water quality in their community. The executive director respectfully requests approval to publish the implementation plan for public comment. Permission is also requested to make non-substantive and clerical corrections before providing the document for public notice. Thank you, and we are available to answer any questions that you have. Thank you again, Ms. Hall. Colleagues, any questions? No, thank you. Ms. Smith, has anyone signed in to speak? No. Mr. Arthur. OPIC again supports publication of the draft, Im draft implementation plan. I'm having a deja vu. Um, <laughs> well, let me again thank the stakeholders in this process and colleagues, I'm ready to put this out for uh, public comment. I would move that we approve the publication of and the solicitation of public comment on the draft implementation plan for five total maximum daily loads for indicator bacteria and uh, Hillbrandt, I almost said Hildebrandt because I know some Hildebrandts, Hillbrandt Bayou and Neches River title as recommended by the executive director. I second the motion. 
The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next items. That takes us to our enforcement docket, which are items six through 31. The executive director staff is here to present these matters. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. For the record, my name is Melissa Cordell of the Enforcement Division, and with me today are Michael Parrish, also of the Enforcement Division, and Gitanjali Yadav of the Litigation Division, representing the executive director. Pending before you items six through 31, the total assessed administrative penalties are $513,398 with $90,143 deferred, $88,935 applied for supplemental environmental projects, and $334,320 to the general revenue. We respectfully request approval of these items and are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Cordell. I have none. Any questions, Thank colleagues? You. Seeing none, Ms. Smith, has anybody signed in to speak? Um, we have folks signed in on 9 through 12, 18, and 20 who are here if the commission has any questions, but otherwise didn't ask to address. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Arthur, what say you? OPIC supports adoption of these enforcement orders as presented by the ED staff. I do too. Colleagues? I, I've got a motion of, unless. Uh, yeah, I, I move that we adopt item 6 through 31 as recommended today by the executive director. I second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Item 32 is the consideration of the monthly enforcement report and the executive director's staff is here to present. Good morning again. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. My name is Melissa Cordell of the Enforcement Division and with me are Michael Parrish of the Enforcement Division and Gitanjali Yada of the Litigation Division. We are here to present the monthly enforcement report for fiscal year 2023 through November. There were 233 effective administrative orders issued and of those 36 contained supplemental environmental projects. These orders assessed a total of $2,752,119 in penalties with a payable amount of $1,725,892. 598,398 are to be paid for supplemental environmental projects. 2,629 notices of violation have been issued through either our field offices or review of self-reported data in our central office and 582 enforcement action referrals have been received. There are 2,257 pending administrative orders with 744 cases that are on the backlog. 191 cases are pending at the Attorney General's office for re representation in district court and three judgments have been issued. 2,128 cases are being tracked for compliance. We have included for review a summary of OCE investigative activities for fiscal years 2021, 22, and 23. We are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you again, Ms. Cordell. I have none. Colleagues, any questions? Again, Ms. Smith, has anybody signed in to speak? No one has signed in on this one. And Mr. Arthur, what do you think? OPIC appreciates the report, and we have no comments at this time. I do too. Uh, colleagues, any comments? I, I merely want to note, um, I'm sure you all share my concern about the number, and uh, I appreciate staff giving this information and also giving us, or giving me at least, good thorough explanations of where all the difficulties are and exist in, in addressing our, this part of our agency's work and what leads to that figure, figure six number, where the backlog is way high than past years. I'm, I'm satisfied that we're, we're making the right asks to address bigger systemic problems for our agency. Uh, some of that discussion's coming up. I don't want to get ahead of us, but uh, I just want to acknowledge that that is a that is an issue, and I'm 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 grateful for staff's continued work and attention on it. I'm not uh, I'm not concerned or worried uh, about about it from the staff angle, aside from the discussion we're going to get to in a bit in terms of our agency's bigger, larger challenges that are at our door. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I've also had sidebar conversations about the backlog and appreciate all the efforts that have gone into to attacking that problem. And I guess in fairness, Ms. Cordell, I can give you the opportunity to say anything about it if, if you'd like to. 
Uh, we appreciate the consideration. Yes, we, our staff is continuing to work hard on, on getting those oldest cases addressed and getting those moving forward and finding ways where we can m just keep things moving. And so, um, as you alluded to, of course, uh, vacancies are a concern with our division, and we do have um, really 35% vacancy rate in our division. And we're continuing to really actively try to hire and recruit. Um, and so we do hope that more people will be coming on board to work with us on this. And, but we are definitely concerned as well and working towards on our plans uh, for addressing the backlog and are meeting some of our internal goals. And we are, are making a lot of progress for future goals too. Thank you, Ms. Cordell. That's an excellent segue to our next item. Anything else, colleagues, on this item? <laughs> I don't want to belabor it, but I, I also would like to just acknowledge how much more difficult the work is these days, considering the positive changes that have been made in that division uh, organizationally, where our staff are now no longer bifurcated to before the order, after the order, but that's a much more difficult ask. And I think that that's just something that we're continuing to adjust to in terms of workload and, and balance of that in the midst of that staff shortage crisis. So thanks. Thanks on those counts. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, thank you again, Ms. Cordell. No action is necessary on this item, so Ms. Smith, I'll ask you when you're ready to please call the next item. Item number 33 is the discussion of vacancies at the agency and strategies to address those vacancies. And the executive director's staff is here to present on this item. Good morning. We appreciate you uh, fitting this little work session type item in, into the agenda. Uh, this is what we do. This is open, right? Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Chairman, Commissioner, General Counsel, Public Interest Counsel. Uh, you might want to pull it a little closer oh, make on. sure they can hear you on the webinar. There we go. Is that better? Uh, <clears throat> for the record, I'm Brent Way, Deputy Executive Director. With me today is Kelly Kill, Director of Office of Administrative Services, and Beth West, Director, uh, Deputy Director for Human Resources and Staff Services. At the August 25th, 2022 work session, we provided an overview of TCQ's workforce, and today we're going to try to provide <clears throat> an update, you know, to, to where we are, where we are currently. As we go through it, you'll see a lot of data that, that goes through it. Uh, and just kind of a pre-note on some of a couple of the, the data points. Some of it may have been taken from 2020. Other, some of it may have been from 2022. So there's a minor discrepancy between some of them that, that could explain explain some of it. <coughs> slide. Where is it? I think I think we're not seeing the slides yet. Here we go. All good now. All right. <clears throat> to refresh our data from August, this slide shows the numbers of newly hired employees and the number of employees departing TCUQ since the first quarter of 2023. Or 23. Uh, TCUQ's turnover rate increased by 6%, over 6% in FY22, placing TCUQ as the number one Article Six agencies and seventh overall of agencies that have 1,000 or more employees. And Brent, if you don't mind, we'll handle this like a work session item with a little less formality and which means that I want to have license just to interrupt you and ask questions as we go along. <laughs> I, absolutely. Okay. We're, we're good with that. Um, and I think they still can't hear you on the webinar. Some of the mics are not as hot as some of the others, so it may need to. Maybe. Do you want to move down? Yeah, you switch might try chairs, to switch yeah. in the chair and see if it, you can get a better one. <laughs> I actually like the one that's quiet. <laughs> um, I guess it's Is just that, a. that one better? Um, I, I think you might want to. Go Pull it in tight closer. and just yeah. speak up, I guess. Okay. Is that better? That there is, we go. That is, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Brent. Just the, I think it's a comment, not a question. I'll put a question mark at the end of it, though. But what we're looking at here, that, that final pair of, of bars, that's just one quarter of, of data. So if we were to main, keep on pace, we would expect the turnover rate 
for 2023 if, it, if we maintain the pace to be you know, roughly the same as it was in 2022? I think at this point, we, we've really not seen, it, it is it's one quarter. Yeah. <clears throat> but I don't think we've necessarily seen anything that would indicate it's going to be different. Yeah, okay. And until obvious changes are, you know, could possibly come about that, we, that we'll discuss. Appreciate that. Uh, in FY22, we were pretty aggressive and successful in hiring. Uh, it was an employee's job market um, during that time. Uh, they had more opportunities, I mean, but unfortunately, a lot of them opted to leave TCQ for a variety of reasons. Uh, using the SAO's ex exit survey and with a response rate of nearly 50%, which I, is probably the highest response rate in the state from the TCQ, so it, it does provide a, what we think is a pretty significant data point. And uh, <clears throat> uh, it showed that TCQ is not alone in this. That SA reported statewide turnover, better pay, better benefits, surpassed retirement for the first time since 2008. Uh, <clears throat> with this much fluctuation in staffing, we, we, the outcome of that is we're demanding a lot more of current employees. Uh, we're demanding more current, from current managers. Um, what they, the place that a lot of the managers find themselves in, and I think a lot of people can speak directly to it, they're, they're managing workload, they're managing expectations, they're managing quality and quantity, but they're also in a continuous stage of hiring, posting, hiring, trying to get new staff on board and in. Uh, yeah, and if I can interrupt and just, yeah. uh, another observation, I mean, uh, a high vacancy rate and turnover are, they're different problems, but they're very related problems. And um, something that a high turnover can mask is, you know, there are, there are bodies in, their, in those chairs, but they are, they may be new bodies, um, they often are, and they are nowhere near as effective as uh, employees that have some tenure. So um, we, I think, it, I think right now where this agency is is we're feeling a double crunch, um, both in terms of a, of a very high number of vacancies, but also a high percentage of of new employees that um, that just don't have the the effectiveness or efficiency of of more tenured employees at this point. You no, know, and, and I think every <clears throat> every division in in most sections out there experiencing the same thing because you you get bifurcated duties there and that you know you we have experienced where we do have experienced and tenured you know employees they're having to provide that training and everything but it's at the same time taking away from everything that they normally do but and and it's not to say we we hire really good staff but they have to become experienced and in, in, in trained in what we do. And so it, uh, we still have to maintain that and push that forward. And there are a lot of things in place to aid with that, but you can't replace that experience right out of the gate. Uh, you know, decisions are different, you know, whenever, whenever, because you don't have the bandwidth of that experience to know that there is flexibility in one spot or not another. I tell staff a lot, you know, in, in past jobs, you know, flexibility comes with experience and knowing what you can give flexibility on what we review, don't you do, versus uh, being, being trained to do something specifically in a specific way. Mm -hmm. You don't know at that time that you can shift from that in certain, certain areas. Appreciate just, that. I, I do have a question also, sure. just as a point of reference. I see our turnover rate up there, but do we have a current number on um, on the total number of vacancies or, or the the total number of authorized FTEs and the total number of vacancies? Total number of vacancies at the end of December was 420. 420, okay. And total number of authorized FTEs currently? Okay. Yeah, it's in that 2,800 range, I think, but uh, that would, it, since it came from me, it absolutely needs to be fact-checked, <laughs> but just to be clear. <clears throat> All right, I'm finished interrupting for now. Oh, no, that's go good. Ahead. Uh, it, it, it's taken us directly down the path that we, that we had intended to go down. So um, I'm going to jump in with that answer, 2,821. Thank you. I got lucky. Like <laughs> Another issue that we've run into that relates directly to it is uh, 
and it speaks directly to your comment, Chairman, is 47% of staff have five years or less experience. That's, that's a pretty significant number uh, whenever you look at it uh, as far as being able to produce the quality and the quantity of, of work product that, that we as a, you know, a state service agency needs, strives to do. Uh, and we've already spoken to the decreased institutional knowledge and negative impact on, on the mission. Slide. <coughs> There are there is some good news uh, in here as far you know uh, once you look for it you you can find it, but uh, in looking at the at the surveys that we were discussing the exit, the exit surveys and the high percentage that we got, one thing is clear: uh, we have a good culture, we have a good work environment, uh, people like working here, and all things being equal, th they would stay here. And, and continue their careers here. But the one thing that is, that is holding them back is, is the opportunity, it, it's affordability. It for, it's family affordability is what it comes down to. What, where can I go to, to best provide? And as we all know, that's even exacerbated in, in Austin with, with rent prices, things like that. So they, they have to make those choices. Uh, we had an, an, an NRS four uh, this is a direct quote uh, from them said, I enjoyed my time at this agency. However, the pay isn't competitive with the number of years experience that I have. Uh, this agency has so much turnover and a lot of additional work is asked each year of more senior staff and has you know, caused burnout. Uh, that individual also uh, said they would, they, they would come back. And, and a lot of them would, uh, would come back. And I think that speaks a lot to the personal environment that we create here at the agency and, and the way that we treat our employees and, and try to develop as much as we can. We just hit that one obstacle, you know, for a larger than average percentage. The importance of the mission, I think that, that inspires a lot of people. That helps me get out of bed in the morning. I feel like we're, ser you know, serving our... Uh, our fellow Texans serving our neighbors, yeah. You know, so, so mm -hmm. I agree. My, you know, I think we. I, I'm familiar with a little bit different statistic. The one that I've been citing on the exit surveys that, is that just over 80 percent of respondents said that they would return to TCEQ. Um, so we're we're close, but I'm seeing a little bit of disconnect in our figures. So we can, unless you have an answer for that, we can sort that out offline. I think this is an instance of. Uh, <clears throat> this is exit surveys for FY23 quarter one. Okay. And okay. I think if you were to, if you were to extrapolate that out to an entire year, <clears throat> if nothing changed, I, I think you would probably see a similar number. You know, for for the for the full year, I can't say, obviously can't say for sure, but uh, really don't see anything that would necessarily change that. We don't change the way that we manage. We don't change the way that we engage. You know, staff. So, in any event, the point's the same. A, a yeah. high percentage of employees would be happy to return to, or you know, probably happy to continue working at TCQ if they could afford to work at TCQ. Is what I take away from it. Exactly. And, and in years, years, years past, I remember times during the agency where that might not have been true. Yeah. But you know, past this commission, past commissions, past executive offices have done a lot to enhance that work environment. I just need to point something out. It, it appears to me that we just treated employee morale kind of like air quality. We're, we're in between the lines dickering over whether we need to be assessing the number <laughs> over over a quarter basis, whether that'll be a, a hold, hold fast. There's an interesting implication of looking back over the statistics over a year, whether uh, what the employees look like if, if there are material differences between quarter one versus quarter four employees over the course of the state year. But I, I just have to observe this is a um, our agency is so well equipped at taking data and trying to respond to it. I'm, I'm pleased with the depth that we're looking at it. The much, obviously, the much higher salaries contribute, as we see, from, from, a, from, a, from a data point, you know, of, of, of making choice, you know. And uh, currently, uh, TCQ's average salary is about 63000 a year, whenever you look across it. Uh, 
de uh, departing employees reporting that over 30 percent will be making that that our employment will, make, will be making over seventy-five thousand dollars a year in their new jobs. You said th over 30 percent. Yes. Thanks. Uh, and a third of those of that a subset of that of that 30 percent will be making over a hundred thousand a year. Um, Another 45% reporting that you're leaving jobs for pay between 50 and 75,000. And, and that really directly relates to, I think, and Beth can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the classification that they were in, too. I mean, obviously, lower classifications, you know, will have a lower range. And so they'll still move up for better pay, but it may only be from 50 to 60,000 or something, something like that. Uh, we had, just as a comparison from a federal source, and this is just one source, I think we would have to look at other ones. But as an example, when you look at EPA, uh, this one source states that they're about 129000 a year. Average salary. Average salary. Um, that's with 14,000 employees approximately. Uh, that's 7,000 of those employees making 95000 to 127000 More than double TCQ's yes. Yes. average salary. And I think you'll find that at, at some other federal agencies, too. Uh, as far as from my past experience, uh, as an example, and, and uh, probably aware of this too, uh, we, we, we're, we're losing section managers one right after the other in certain areas going to the Nuclear Reg Regulatory Commission. Uh, and they're doing it knowing full well that they're going to have to move to Chicago uh, to do it. So that there's got to be something there that, uh, now I'm not saying that, you know, necessarily that, we can, that we're going to be able to hit that $129,000 mark, but I do think we have room in comparison to the other state agencies and, and especially Title VI, you know, natural resource agencies to make, to make that move. Uh, what are some of the reasons that, that may be causing this, why it's all important? Uh, I mean, do you look at uh, population growth? and the number of regulated entities that, that we're going through right now. Uh, you know, from, since 2020, we've gone from 20, around 21 million to 30 million population, about 30% increase. And uh, for Texas regulated entities, from 315,000 to 771,000 regulated entities. That, that's a big jump. Uh, previous slide, we, we had a little misstep on the percentage but we I think we clarified that but uh, I'm checking you I didn't bring my calculator <laughs> we're such nerds it's gonna take a minute keep talking okay uh, Brent can you say because it's hard to see what the years are on that from yes it's 20 it, it, it's about 12 years 2000 to 2022 is, is, is the data points that, that we selected I, I, I believe you're going to make this point, but I, I, I would love to see the two data points comparing what our agency's uh, appropriations and, and FTE counts and some of those things were alongside this comparison of Texas population uh, and, and number of Texas regulated entities, because I think those are really materially important factors to try to present for our legislators what, uh, what this agency's demands and workload inputs what they equate to in terms of the well, supports from the state. Correct. While we didn't go down the fiscal side of it, we have fewer employees now than we did then as far as number of FTEs. <clears throat> so it's uh, a lot of people to now. Beth? No, the FTE account is down. Sorry. Well, there are, yeah, and there are authorized FTEs, and then there's the actual, you know, number of actual seats filled. And yeah, I think you do have to consider that vacancy number too. You know, and and in the, you know, in terms of the number of of employees that we have at work um, over the last decade, you know, the information that I'm familiar with is that we've had, um, and this factoring in vacancies, um, 2,600 somewhere between 2,600 and 2,700 employees in their chairs working. Um, and that number's been pretty constant over the last decade. And now doing the math, what do we say? We had 20, um, 28, 28, 21 authorized FTEs, 420 vacancies. So um, 2,400 people in their, in their chairs. So 
you know, 200 emplo fewer employees, roughly, um, at least 200 fewer employees than has been the norm over the last decade or so, um, which is Correct. consequential. And then for the, the, the FY 2002 number that we had with 2,962 FTEs, we'd have to go back and look, but I, I would question if that vacancy rate was quite to the level that we have found ourselves now. Uh, it, it may be, I can't put a number on it, but other factors included in that. N nowhere near where we are now, based on the information that I've reviewed. I can't imagine that reviewed. we would be. Slide five. Obviously, the, the work that we do, as in just as an example, the, the permits that we review. I mean, it, it, you know, the permits that we issue are one of the driving forces by the economic growth and development of, of, of the state. Uh, we saw 771,000 new regulated entities. Uh, nearly all of those require some kind of authorization to do business uh, in one way or another. Uh, compliantly, uh, that's a, that's a big number, even if it's small deal. But but a lot of the permits that that we do review are extremely technical. Uh, they they add an example I've used in the past. You know, from certain regulated entities, we can get an application in, and it's five or six boxes on two dollars, uh, and eighty percent of that application is engineer drawings that requires someone with a highly technical background and experience to appropriately review those and it and it takes a long time to do it i mean 450 you know 500 days you know even longer depending on some many cleanups take years because of the the depth of review that it takes over a period of time and that's i think that's true in many of our programs whether it's whether it's air whether it's waste whether you know it's water water quality uh, and it requires you know people to be in those positions that that can that can ha handle that as an example uh, underground injection control section which reviews some of the most complex permits that we have uh, coming out there I mean they'll have well logs well over 150 feet long that they have to roll out across the office down there and reviews ev review every inch of it uh, it takes a, a lot of time, geologist, <clears throat> and it really kind of re gets us to a point of what you, we've talked about in the past are, are critical positions that I guess you could say are somewhat unique. Uh, you know, as an agency, what we've found in this study, though, that we have about 35 classifications that are somewhat unique as far as performing core functions of the agency, but uh, they have they had one engineer that was able to do this. Uh, we were able to get another one. They, you know, they, they have two more vacancies and, they, and honestly they could, they could probably use five or six. But it's just not engineers, it's, a, it's a geologists, professional geologists. And I would argue those are probably two of the highest, of those licenses professions, that's two of the highest pressured uh, positions or uh, licensed positions, not just because of other state agencies, but the, ver the, but the very work environment they have within the state. Ideal geologists for that kind of work are petroleum geologists. They're a little busy, you know, right now, uh, you know, in, in, in other parts of the state. It's very difficult to get them to hire them. Uh, engineers, uh, as an example, we can talk about earlier, uh, we have We've, we've actually made quite a bit of progress in that, and it's really, and it's really the, the amount of progress is directly attributable to past executive offices in this commission, and that's the efforts that went along of sending targeted pay raises to engineers, and it reduced the gap. It, it did, but those targeted pay raises, while it can help with other state agencies, it, it can, it, there are a lot of in, the industry out there, they're always wanting to hire a licensed engineer. And it's a, it's a it's a difficult position to try to compete with that, and I'm not saying that, that we necessarily could, but it's but when we have engineers leave, that's when we run into the real problem. It's very difficult to hire them in, and what we end up having to do is uh, 
we'll, we'll have an pos engineering position open as an example. We'll post it. We may get one application. We may get two. At the tops, that's almost unheard of. And so what happens, you go through this process of trying to, to work it through as through an, an, an engineering classification, and you end up having to drop down to, uh, to an engineering specialist, get them in. These are individuals who typically have a degree in engineering, but they have not gone through the process of, of obtaining their PE. Now, we have a program here, you know, that, that we kind of restarted to do that, to help them get their PEs. Here's the issue with that it is once we develop them and mentor them and they get their PEs, they find another job, you know, once they have, have that certification. So it's kind of an ongoing cycle. But that's not to discount the, the efforts that are made to do everything we can to rectify that. Uh, something else we did is a $5,000 signing bonus, and that's helped. But, uh, and those were targeted positions, uh, and I don't mean to go on too long about that, but it, no, I appreciate that. And the signing bonus helps get them in the door, but it doesn't necessarily keep them. It doesn't. It has helped. Yeah. It, it, it does, in a way, it does create a little sense of loyalty there, and, and that somebody would, you know, would come up and, 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 and give that to them, and it gives them a, a boost, you know, in the beginning, too. So, so it has had an effect, but, uh, but the things that, that most drastically affect it it's going to be difficult to, to uh, compare with. It's just we just have to be diligent and vigilant, you know, as far as uh, we have 16 engineers that have between 20 and 35 years experience. And so many of those are uh, 16 across the entire agency. The agency. But they're concentrated in, in a, generally, they're generally concentrated, concentrated in, in permitting areas and some uh, remediation cleanup, cleanup areas. Uh, but that's, that's, that's when it really hurts whenever you lose one of those individuals to, to replace that institutional knowledge. But uh, we, can, we, we congratulate them, though, on making, <laughs> meeting the milestone because they earned it. But... Uh, Tell me, on the $5,000 signing bonus, which, you know, I'm all for, but how does that work? Do you have to work for a year? I don't, I don't remember the details. Or I mean, do you just get it when you get the job or, I don't know, whoever? <laughs> Beth would best be the one best to speak to that. I don't know. Does she need to be on the microphone? Um, Probably. No one on the webinar would Probably be. Probably so. Like, no yeah, if you can find a microphone. Yeah. I just... Uh, I had Beth and Kelly here because it would like be a double digit percentage that I would misspeak something. <laughs> so. Here I am. Okay, so your question about recruitment bonuses, the yeah. way that works, it's a statutory setup. So yeah. we request that permission to do that from the comptroller's office. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's for new employees to the agency. So it's, it is a true recruitment bonus. So um, they sign a contract when they come in. They uh, actually get paid within uh, 60 days, that uh, mm -hmm. recruitment bonus. If they leave before a year of service, then mm -hmm. there's a prorated return of that okay. bonus. We have that program in place for engineers and health physicists because of the specialized nature of the work for those two, two classifications. We have retention bonus programs in place for other positions, mm -hmm. engineering specialists, natural resource specialists, contract specialists, and I'm missing one. I think the health physicists also benefit from that program. I may have missed one, but that's the yeah. that's the major groupings. Yep. That's helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Just one curious data point on the slide uh, is it, the ranking of within the state of the positions that we have, and we're in. You can see how crucial, you know, we're number one in the state and, you know, in the number of geoscientists and geologists and toxicologists and hydrologists, number two in engineers, number three in engineering specialists. I mean, it points directly to the FDE distribution of critical need uh, classifications. We are, we are very heavy on, on STEM, science and engineering yes. professionals. It's, I mean, it's what we do more than any other agency, yes. just about, yeah. 
Uh, recurrent turnover rates and loss of expertise in, in these types of jobs, we just don't feel is sustainable in, in, in the long term. I mean, we can, we can, we can make do, but it, it does, still doesn't relieve us of, of staff, of managers, to, uh, the, uh, of the obligation to continue continue the quality and the quantity of work that, that we're charged with. And the single biggest tool that we have to meet that is staff, you know, and highly qualified, highly trained, as well paid as we can achieve staff. And so I think that's kind of the bottom line of, of, what, of what we're trying to do. Uh, as, as it is, slide six, yeah. Uh, we're generally not competitive with, with the other, other state agencies, you know, of, of similar, Similar work, similar background, similar size, uh, as, as you kind of break down. Uh, Although, to your last slide, I'm not sure that the profile of our uh, of our personnel maps to other state agencies that I would agree because that. we are so heavy mm -hmm. uh, on engineers and scientists of, of various stripes. I, I think that's a really good point, and uh, and I. And that's an important point because it does set us aside, set us apart as to why. Uh, we need assistance in those particular areas to continue that because it, you can't look at other state agencies and say that's the same thing you know you need you have you have the same need no you don't uh, not not exactly uh, at least that part of it is unique to us it gives us some uniqueness uh, returning our focus to, to salaries uh, within article 6 natural resource agencies we remain consistently below midpoint of salaries, I believe the, the most recent SAO audit pointed that that's where we all should be to a certain degree. Uh, other state agencies, and you can, and they're different for different reasons. Their funding sources are different, you know. So it's, I, I don't know that it's it's a crystal clear data point. But when you start looking at, at, at the differential as an example, comparing to say GLO, uh, seventy-eight percent of its staff or above midpoint 22 percent positions are under the competitive salary we are 78 percent below the midpoint and only 22 percent above uh, that midpoint and I, I think it's a significant number whenever you look at the kind of employees that we have and, and mm -hmm. what what they what we would argue their value would be on the state open market and i'm not talking about Dow or anybody else or industry. I'm talking about, you know, in comparison to, to our market, other state agencies. So it's pretty significant, uh, I, I think, and I, th I think that's maybe an extreme point. You probably look it in there, but it, I think it's, a, it's, worth, uh, it's worth looking at as, as, as far as the, the comparative as, as to where we're at. Even the SAO has recommended that all state agencies and you can do that. I mean, you, you can make that recommendation. Uh, all it takes is money, you know, <laughs> as, as far as funding, you know, to be able to, to hit that. And, and we, we have certainly asked for that. Uh, slide seven. Uh, and we have gone through and proposed salary, in, in, proposed salary increases that we've seen. Um, the two 5% increase of next biennium if you if you apply that in a blanket manner it not only does it not bring us up it actually puts us further behind you know example being somebody makes a hundred thousand somebody else makes two hundred thousand one gets five thousand the other gets ten thousand yeah so you're talking about the legislature's proposal to do uh, it across the board yeah. five percent right. this year and another five percent the following year and if if a tcq natural resource or engineer let's say is is paid less than a sister agency's mm -hmm. engineer, all, all else being equal, you, you give them both a 10% increase, you've just increased the delta. Exactly. <laughs> you haven't actually, That's your you point. haven't improved it, you've actually increased the, you know, right. the disparity. Right. And so, uh, and that's one of the things that, that we're trying to consider, you know, that, uh, you know, in uh, proposals that, you know, that we'll be, that we're putting before the ledge, you know, is to, to, cover that delta in, in, in every way we can and to 
deliver us a, 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 a budgetary point that's, that's competitive. And uh, I, I think that's the goal. Uh, I, I, I think uh, as everyone goes downtown to talk about that, I think we have a good story, you know, to, to relay that. Uh, I think our challenge is going to be uh, not letting it get lost in all the other things that can distract from it. Uh, you know, whether, whether it's, it's other priorities, other things that, that come up, and it, that, that, that's going to take a good sell job, you know, if, that, we're, that we're all willing to, you know, do our part in. Uh, <clears throat> you know, in reality, the SAO recommended minimum salary is actually below what the current, in, what currently pay, TCQ pays, and we'll remain far below the competitive level. So we're, we're to a point where... Uh, Say that again? Are you saying that yeah, the I SAO think, yeah. recommendations are not realistic? The, exactly. Yeah. Uh, as far as meeting a, a need in, in... I mean, right now, you know, using an old term, you know, as far as the vacancies and everything else, we're trying to turn the Titanic. You know, it's, it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot more foresight and warning than the Titanic got. So uh, we, and that's what we're trying to do right now is uh, get, get out ahead of it as, as, as much, continue to be out ahead of it as much as it can and it relies, it would be all of us that, that has to carry that message and, and continue to do so not only in this, you know, legislative sessions but in future ones as well. Uh, that pretty much concludes uh, Everything we'd like to say, we came here to uh, provide y'all an opportunity to ask questions, discuss, if appropriate, give guidance, uh, you know, and uh, just give you an idea of where we're at in comparison to where we were and uh, where we feel like we, we could be both positively, you know, if, if certain things can happen and, and quite possibly negatively if certain things, if we're not able to accomplish certain things. Thank you, Brent. Um, colleagues, thoughts? Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I have a lot of thoughts. I don't really have that many. I only really have kind of one question, so I'll just say that, and then I'll just kind of write off some quick thoughts. I know the exec office had been, um, I don't know what, I put together a task force on hiring, um, you know, ways, you know, got everyone from all across the agency together, and I, I think that's an ongoing thing. Um, but. And if you are not to a point to speak to anything, that's fine. But I'm just kind of curious on what, if anything, has come out of that yet. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of a lot of smart people in this agency that have been here a long time. Um, also, as we've learned today, a whole lot of people that haven't been here a very long time. But has has that been fruitful? Have you all been able to take away things yet from that? Has it been long enough to even? I, I think Beth could speak to it too, but yeah. yes, it, it, you know, short answer, yes, it has been fruitful to, in, in, in areas. It certainly has. Yeah. I know Beth's shop and everything, they've done a lot in, you know, there is much marketing as we have mm -hmm. done. We're increasing that, you know, we're, we're trying to get in front of uh, STEM universities, you know, to increase, yep. uh, I've, you know, I've, I've even gone to uh, universities to talk to their, uh, to some of their science groups, you know, in, in the price of, you know, graduating in bioenvironmental science or something like that. And I've, we've actually hired three different people out of that one group, you know. But You're it's just, just showing off now, Brent. Well, <laughs> they, they probably did it in spite of, as opposed to... Except we need to improve this place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, they can say, yeah, we can, we can fix that. <laughs> but... Uh, it is. It's a, it's a lot of different things that came out of it. Uh, a lot of things that we can't, some things that we can't do, yeah. some things that, uh, you know, how we look at uh, retention, as a matter of fact. It's not just getting people in the door. Yeah. It's, it's, it's keeping the Holding people on to, yeah. that we've got. And uh, those, those things kind of go hand in hand. The more that you can keep, the fear that you, that you, have, that you have to hire, and hopefully you can, you know, concentrate those efforts on hiring in area in, in other areas as opposed to that one I don't, I don't know if that's real clear but yeah uh, and what I, uh, go ahead Kelly sorry just to add on to what Brent said I, we have been able to streamline the process um, I think one of the things we've done too is really enhance communication inside the agency to make sure people are available of all the hiring tools that are yeah. available 
to hiring supervisors as an example like Brent touched on um, there's the transition pool there's our internship internship program I think those are all really great mechanisms to attract new talent to the agency but that hasn't really been our challenge right we're able to attract the new talent the challenge has been keeping the talent yeah well you know I, I've this is always my ask I guess you know y'all get together and you have a task force and you talk internally and I don't really know what the three of us could do up here to help with that I mean I'm not hiring many um, but it, it, I do want to know what we can do to help and if you said it's go get money from the ledge okay Lena I got it that's my marching orders that's what I'll work on but just keep that in mind you know mm -hmm. when y'all are bouncing ideas off what can we do to help and if and if the answer is we just need we really need help with you know money from the ledge just tell it that but you know I don't know I feel like I could I could really dive in hard on this topic I would love to just talk about it all day but I will respect other people's time I do want to just applaud OAS man y'all have just um, since I mean for the past three years now we're coming up on three years you know getting us through COVID uh, getting us where we are now with all these vacancies still carrying us I just I'm I'm so impressed with um, everyone in OAS and they probably aren't listening but I, I I really want to applaud them you know I think we could um, we could do a deep dive and we could probably come up with a lot of the answers on historically how we got here I don't think it's worthwhile um, I'd rather look to the future um, you know I think there are a lot of things over the years that were probably out of our hands right the ledge said or whoever <laughs> uh, someone not us said you know you've got to decrease by five percent or you've got you know whether it was budget or just at some point I believe we even had to have a huge FTE cut um, and so maybe that's what started a lot of this and the the main point I want to make is just looking to the future I just want us to have a little bit um, different mentality and I've had to do this myself um, I don't want us to be scared of asking for FTEs if that's what we need um, and I don't want us to be scared of asking for money if that's what we need and you know I don't think we'll ever go crazy and go bonkers with our requests that we're usually very conservative and very um, you know appropriate in what we ask for and we don't ask for above our means but I mean this is the year this is the legislature to, to ask for it and if they say no they say no and I just I think there's a way and I'm gonna try and think on this and I'll probably be calling y'all to bounce some of my ideas off off bounce my ideas off y'all and see what you think but I just kept honing on on that 771,000 entities I mean my if you just that is mind-blowing to me um, because I just start okay I'm really not gonna talk long but I just start thinking about all the ripple effects of that that's 771,000 entities well how many employees do they have how many actually Texas families are affected by that entity how many people live by that entity you know I mean we I mean it is it's unfathomable for me to just you know try and calculate how much we touch everything and how substantial this agency is and I, I think people know that but you kind of said it Brent I think you said you know we need to we need to sell it and and I consider that kind of my job this legislature you know we all have different different tasks and different jobs and you know I don't get really really involved on analyzing bills so I plan to get really really involved on our budget as much as I can so um, I'm not gonna say anymore I just um, I, I I'm gonna probably go back and rewatch this presentation a few times I'm probably gonna be taking things from this PowerPoint if not just the whole PowerPoint and sharing it with everyone I can because it's in, it's kind of mind-blowing the data that's in there so good work to y'all um, we you know we we might not get you know we should all be grateful for the 10 percent biennium raise um but I, but i do think we are owed more <laughs> i'll just say it that way and so um i plan on i plan on trying to you know be somewhat successful in that area and try and get us our, our employees more because um it's not just our employees that deserve more money it, it it's a whole lot of I, anyway i'll stop i think you get my point but uh, I'm really grateful this we're gonna be talking about it a lot more because I'm just I don't know I'm into this topic so sorry in advance but thank y'all I don't have any other questions the only thing I'd like to add is I, I really wanted to thank Kelly and and and, and Beth and, and and their staff for uh, 
they manufacture this, create this, slap it down in front of me, and that's that's that's, that's they they do all this, and the the Herculean efforts that they have made, you know, in just over the past few years, that, that is is certainly to be commended. I'm very appreciative. Commissioner Janeka, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share? I uh, everything ditto everything Commissioner Lindley said. Thank you. Um, I have a few thoughts. Um, yeah, I think our, uh, you know, our, our number one obligation is just to communicate as clearly as we can to the legislature what the current status of the agency is and, um, and, and share our view of what challenges the agency faces and what our prescription um, is for fixing it. So whatever they decide to do, um, they're making their decisions with good information. Um, now, when we start talking about, you know, we, we have determined that at least part of our, our problem, our turnover problem and our vacancy problem, probably a very significant part of that problem is salary dollars. And so we have, um, we have diagnosed that problem and we've made a recommendation to, to fix it. And because we want to maintain the quality of services that we provide, we are, we are selling that. We are advocating for it. We want that. But we need to be perfectly clear with the legislature of, you know, what, you know, what are the outcomes of the various um, of the various uh, choices they may make with the budget, and I think what I'd like to highlight is just you know some of the some of the background in terms of context, and we have demands on this agency just in the aggregate increasing, and our capabilities are falling, so. A little bit of detail on falling capabilities. You know, for the, um, I'm looking at data from about the last 15 years on the number of of, um, of FTEs who we actually had in their chairs. And as I mentioned before, for the last decade, um, up until just recently, um, we averaged pretty steady. You know, somewhere between 2,600 and 2,700 employees, and that's running a Vacant, um, vacancy rates of, you know, below 200. Um, for the five years before that, so leading up to 2011, where we had a big correction, we had um, 28, 2,900 employees in, in their chairs. So, for example, in 2011, we actually had 3,000 FTEs and uh, fewer, than, um, fewer than 200 vacancies. So over 2,800 employees in their chairs. Currently, we have, you know, as we noted before, um, what, about 2,400, maybe not quite 2,400 employees. That, that's a big difference. And what's happened, what's happened in terms of, uh, okay, let me continue on capabilities and I'll get to demands. Um, our capabilities have clearly just dropped off dramatically in the last couple of years, really just coming back from COVID. Um, the other thing that you point out in terms of um, capabilities is that roughly half of our employees have fewer than five years, so that affects our capabilities. Um, so steep, de steep de recent decline. Um, all right, let's look at demand. And you pointed out, you know, correctly that the population has grown dramatically in Texas. The number of regulated entities is, you know, up well over 100 percent in the last. 20 years, um, the numbers that, um, you know, they, they mirror the number of, uh, um, for the growth in, in GDP. I think the numbers I'm familiar with over the last 20 years is that the state GDP grew from about 0.8 trillion to 1.8 trillion. And so quantitatively, more regulated entities, bigger economy, bigger population, quantitatively, the demand is growing on the agency. Um, I think the demand is also growing qualitatively because for any given transaction we do, there are more open records requests. There are more requests for public meetings, more requests for contested case hearings, more litigation. Um, and so we have demand on the agency going like this, and especially in the last couple of years, our capabilities just falling off. And so something has to... Um, either we need to correct that or something is going to give. And um, I just don't think that um, 
we can sustain over the long haul, um, it's almost axiomatic, we cannot sustain over the long, long haul the level of service, the quality of service this, that this agency has provided um, with, those, with those dynamics. Um, and um, you know, we feel it in how quickly we move uh, um, enforcement cases, what our backlog looks like, how, how quickly we can respond to permits. We've made such great strides in improving permitting timelines over the last couple of years. Well, if you, we don't have the permit writers to write those permits, that, that number is gonna, you know, we're gonna be backsliding. Um, and it also increases risk in a, just in a number of different ways. You know, we can't hire auditors. We're increasing the opportunity that there will be fraud, waste, and abuse. We don't have sufficient engineers to do um, dam safety inspection for the growing number of high hazard dams. That poses a risk. You know, of course, there's, um, you know, obvious environmental risks if, if um, you know, we don't have sufficient employees to respond to emergency responses. You know, we have a, you know, $100,000 plus piece of air monitoring equipment, which is great. We're grateful for that. We need somebody to calibrate it and to drive it around and to, to interpret that data. Um, so anyway, it goes on and on. So um, Emily, like you, I'm, I'm concerned about where we are. Um, we, we are all passionate about this agency. Um, I think the, the, um, the legislature appropriately will look, us, look at us in a more objective fashion. So our duty to the legislature is just to be very clear about you know, where, we, where we think we are, situ situational awareness, our, our uh, demand on the agency is growing dramatically, our capabilities have fallen, um, fallen over the, the ledge a little bit the last couple of years, and um, you know, let them bring their wisdom to what our budget should be. So. That, that's all I have to say. Um, I think that's very well said. If we just need to lay it out like that. These are our capabilities. These are the demands. And this is the outcome. And then let them, you know, do what they do. I, I want to ask each of you, I'm, 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 I wonder, uh, I can't help but see a connection between this and many of the issues raised uh, by the Sunset Review. Uh, by the leg members of the legislature on that on that commission, the staff in, in discussion, highlighting public concerns, public intentions. I can't help but wonder how much of these uh, just execution challenges and issues and, and degradation in, in operational posture uh, that we can't deny. Uh, looking back on our agency and looking at these data and, and really concerning recent trends that are not sustainable. I'll, I'll second that, what you say, Chairman. Uh, how much of our criticism bound up in that sunset report and uh, adjustments for, for revision and do more and do better, which some of those changes will add to that workload that you allude to. We will have a deeper and more robust work on our, on our plate related to the agency website if we are successful in being really transparent and really open in the way that we need to become and, and have it move towards. And so I, I would ask each of you to hear, to what, do you agree that this may be an issue that we need to raise more in the context of discussing our agency sunset review with members and stakeholders? You mean how, what, what's gonna come out of it? If the sunset report was adopted how it was, what, okay, let me put it, eventually what's in a bill and then what it, uh, effect it could have on our agency's capabilities to do that, is that what kind of what you're? Exactly right. How much are you highlighting this element as you're discussing or planning to discuss with stakeholders the issues raised in the Sunset Report and that, that inevitable looking backwards report card review posture that will come of our agency this session, especially as we're going through that Sunset Review? Well, I'll, I'll uh, I mean, I think, you know, <clears throat> I think it's definitely our job, you know, when appropriate to Make sure the members understand that, that are going to be, well, all the members will be voting on the bill, but, you know, the main, whatever committee our bill goes through, committees. Anyway, let me, I, I do think um, what we, I guess, submitted yesterday, our updated exceptional item request, I think that's, I'm glad that we did that. And I don't know, you know, I think we've probably all seen it. Um, but I'm glad, I'm really, really glad that we um, 
added items to our exceptional item requests that are included in the sunset bill. I think that's the best way to highlight it. So I think we've done that. So then, you know, I might have a, if I think it through more, I might change, change my thoughts a little, but I think that's the best way to go about it is to now point to our exceptional item requests and say, you know, these are in the sunset bill. And so if you want us to get them done, it, co it costs money. And, and they're not that substantial of requests. I, I don't know what the new items total up, but Technically, our whole exceptional item request went down than the original total, I think. Um, so I don't know. That's kind of my knee-jerk reaction is I think the best thing we can do right now is point to our now exceptional item requests because we do now incorporate the things that I think Sunset uh, put in there that cost us money. <laughs> I appreciate that. And to make sure we're staying on the topic, we've noticed the, the vacancies in that in that sunset item, the exceptional item pieces uh, that we're addressing and highlighting the need for. Uh, I think yeah. that's a great yeah. great connection as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's I we're on the same cents. page. Yeah. Yeah, I just have a couple reactions to the sunset conversation. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I talked about the growing demands on this agency, and I think the sunset's recommendations are kind of right in line to what I was trying to explain earlier about the public's expectation of our agency is growing. And, um, you know, I personally think that that is a, a good direction for us to grow in terms of being um, more user friendly with, you know, technology to provide greater transparency to the public. Um, and, and all of this implicates, um, you know, whether we have the people to, in their chairs to, to do the work. Um, um, as well as other aspects of our budget. But um, so part of the growing demand on the people of our agency is, you know, is that expectation, which is right in line with what the Sunset Commission's recommendations are about. The other observation I'll make about the Sunset Review is it was, as you pointed out, uh, Commissioner Janeka, it, it was retrospective. Um, I don't think it has fully accounted for TCEQ sitting with, um, 420 vacancies. They, we haven't really seen what that agency is going to look like in a few months or a few years. Um, you know, what does, it, what does a TCQ that's been uh, ginned along for a decade with 2,600 or 2,700 employees in their chairs look like um, when there's only 2,400 or 2,380 people in their chairs. What does that look like after six months or a year mm -hmm. um, or two years? I think it's a different agency than the agency that the Sunset Commission reviewed. So for what it's worth, there's a, there's a timing issue. That's a great point. Not to be alarmist, but I entirely agree with you. I yeah. think that in many respects we are past an inflection point where our agency, be because of this issue in, in one part. But thank you. I do have one last comment now. It's a positive. I'm going to end on a good note. Let's end on a good note. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of this was kind of Debbie Downer stuff, but I will say what we should be most proud of, and I know we all are, is while we have had, you know, less employees, more demand, we still kick butt at our job and our employees are the best, right? And even though we're, they are asked to do a lot more than maybe when they initially came on, they do it. And because of that, I feel comfortable in my job. I feel that the agency is doing our job. I would never want anyone to take away anything that we've said today to imply that we don't think we're fulfilling our mission, right? Where we are, I think we are making sure um, public health is protected and, and all those good things. So, you know, while we're going on on about, there's a lot that we can't, or you know, where we're handicapped, we're still doing what um, I think what the public, I just want to be reassuring to anyone that might be listening that we are doing our job and making sure people are protected and that the entities that we need to regulate are regulated. That's my positive note. <laughs> well said. All right, I can't help myself. I, I'm also very proud of our employees and I was bragging on our employees to my uber driver this morning he thought i was nuts but um but no we're fortunate to have a, are they a looking good, for a job a good, did you no he was retired <laughs> he was retired hey yeah you know, um maybe. but um you know we're lucky to have the employees that we do and the culture that we do and and even the ones who are leaving overwhelmingly would like to to stay if they could but 
Um, and we get our job done. Yeah. Thank you for ending us on a positive <laughs> note. Brent, thank you. Um, Kelly, Beth, thank you. Um, I think we're done with this one. And uh, Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next item. Good morning. I know we're having some sound difficulties this morning. I just want to check to make sure we're okay on that. We've got a rowdy vent in the background that's making it extremely difficult to hear. So. Our HVAC is, is <laughs> noisy. Um, how are we doing at the back of the room? Can we, are we coming through all right? Yeah. Okay. We're Great. good. Well, item 34 is the discussion of the agency implementation of Senate Bill 3 from the 87th le uh, legislative session, including requiring affected utilities to submit emergency preparedness plans for agency approval. Good morning. I am Carrie Michelle Kyle. I am the director of the Office of Water. And with me this morning is Craig Pritzlaff, who is the director of the Office of Compliance and Enforcement. We're here this morning to provide the agency's implementation status of Senate Bill 3 from the 87th legislative session. Senate Bill 3 amended the water code to require approximately 4,000 affected utilities to submit emergency preparedness plans to the agency by March 1, 2022, and implement the plans by July 1, 2022, or upon final approval of the agency. To date, the agency has received 3,610 plans for review and approval. Affected utilities could request a waiver to implementing an emergency preparedness plan if the affected utility demonstrates that implementing the plan would result in a financial burden to their customers. The agency to date has received 255 requests for waivers. The agency must review the plans to determine if the alternative power option chosen by the affected utility will be able to provide the system with the electrical power necessary to pressurize the system during emergency situations. Specifically, the plan must demonstrate how the system will operate at or above 20 pounds per square inch during an extended power outage that lasts for more than 24 hours. Affected utilities had 14 alternative power options to choose from. The agency began program development in June of 2021 with the creation of a database to monitor and track compliance, development of standard operating procedures and guidance documents. Outreach activities began in early August 2021. Approximately 4,000 letters were mailed notifying affected utilities of the new requirement to submit emergency preparedness plans statewide. A new web page was created, training and education materials were developed, along with a template for affected utilities to use to complete their plans. During October and November 2021, agency staff began to train and assist affected utilities to develop their plans and responded to nearly 2,000 assistance requests regarding plan requirements. <clears throat> agency staff conducted nine in-person workshops around the state and a training webinar was posted on the agency's YouTube channel. In addition, the agency partnered with the Environmental Protection Agency to hold a statewide resiliency workshop related to power generation. To date, nearly 400 free on-site financial, managerial, and technical assistance visits have been conducted to help utilities draft and submit their plans. Prior to the March 1 plan submittal date, the agency reviewed and approved 837 90-day extension requests to either the March 1st plan submittal or the July 1st plan implementation deadline. The agency is also required to adopt rules to implement Senate Bill 3 requirements and has initiated rulemaking to amend Chapter 290 and 291. The rule package is tentatively scheduled for commission agenda in June for approval to publish notice. In April 2022, approximately 1,400 letters were mailed to affected utilities who had not submitted a plan by the March 1st deadline. The letter requested the submittal of their plans within 60 days or risk receiving a violation. Since June 2022, staff has continued to conduct extensive outreach and technical assistance to the 1,400 affected utilities. 
<coughs> excuse me, to complete and submit their plans. To date, roughly 90% of the 1,400 have submitted their plans to the agency. <coughs> As agency staff have transitioned to reviewing plans and associated implementation deadlines during the last few months, extensive outreach and interaction with affected utilities continues. Staff are working diligently to address plan deficiencies, prolong delays with implementation, and to collect the necessary implementation to be able to approve the plans. Some of the plans are very extensive and complex, requiring a higher skill level and longer review timelines. So the agency has secured additional resources to help ex expedite plan reviews and work through most of the obstacles uh, that are impeding the approvability of the plans. Uh, that concludes my update from the Office of Water. I'm happy to answer any questions or I can hand it over to Craig and we can take those after he concludes. Let's check for questions now. Thank you, Karen Michelle, I have none. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Gary Michelle, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, Public Interest Counsel, Craig Pritzloff, Director of the Office of Compliance and Enforcement. I want to start off first by thanking Carrie Michelle and the Office of Water. This is an issue which requires um, co coordination across the entire agency and across different agencies as well. And this is another example of how well our agency works in terms of internal coordination in implementing these important measures. In terms of Office of Compliance and Enforcement, looking prospectively in terms of compliance with emergency preparedness plans, our plan of action has been similar to how we implemented um, Chapter 13.1395 after Hurricane Ike in 2008 when that provision was enacted by the 81st Legislature. That provision required emergency preparedness plans for water systems within a county uh, that has a population greater than 3.3 million or is adjacent to a county with a population of 3.3 million and has a population of 550,000. It happens to be two counties and that's Harris and Fort Bend County. So the Office of Compliance and Enforcement and Office of Water is familiar with these requirements um, and how to implement this process. And so our plan of action has been similar to how we out outrolled um, on, on that for compliance. And the first stage of that is, is of course, first, has a plan been submitted? Next stage, of course, then is, has it been approved and has it been implemented? And the implementation takes into two phases. Where are we in the implementation schedule for that facility? Um, and has everything been fully implemented if that timeline has been completed? At each one of those stages, there's an opportunity to, for outreach with that entity to obtain compliance and assist them with either one, completing the plan, two, implementing the plan, or three, um, if it's not being implemented, to guide them towards that completion. And so when we look, when I look back at, at, at the prior decade of how we implemented this um, in, in Fort Bend and Harris counties, you'll see an upsurge at, at, at the beginning of the process in, in enforcement actions with respect to submissions of the plans. And then it, then it tails off and gets into a baseline of, of implementation. And so we're right now in the submission of plan phase and then transitioning into implementation. So we have uh, enforcement actions in-house with respect to entities um, that have not yet fully completed submitting a plan and we're working with those entities um, through the enforcement process as, as that proceeds. Uh, the next stage then in, in anticipation. Craig, let me interrupt you yes, real sir. quick. I think our general counsel has the, you might pull it closer then. Sorry, oh, <laughs> that, that I think is a, a problem, <laughs> Mike. Sorry. Doing a mic check on this, is that better? Much that better. Is much better. All right. Thanks. Apologies. Where was I then? You got to about at, ask me a question. I don't think I was oh, actually. Um, yeah. yeah, you were talking about looking at, at um, the uh, kind of the, the history of the enfor enforcement profile and initially that it, it was enforcement around um, developing the plans and then, and then it transitioned into enforcement just around implementation, kind of the baseline. I think that's where you left off. Thank you. So we are at the, at the stage of processing those enforcement actions for, for those facilities, those major and minor source facilities that have not yet submitted a plan of working through that. In advance of the winter um, season for this year, uh, we directed all of our regional offices to begin checking um, in terms of 
So recall for our compliance schedule for water systems, uh, water systems are either on a three, every three year or every five year cycle for investigations. And so as those compliance investigations have been scheduled for each year, we've put into a checklist uh, for, for those facilities. At, so any one of those facilities, when we go and investigate them, maybe at a different stage in that timeline I, uh, I explained to you in terms of submission, implementation, or pending implementation based upon a schedule that's been approved or pending approval of, of their plan. And so depending on where they are, the checklist will vary for each facility. In advance of this uh, winter season, um, uh, which, which then we experienced a winter storm event as well. Uh, our agency and our office coordinated across this agency uh, with Railroad Commission um, in preparation for, for the winter events. We did tremendous amounts of outreach to water systems to ensure that they were prepared uh, for, for, for the winter events. Um, and so after Winter Storm Elliott uh, transpired, we did an after action report and, and did, a, did a comparative look back in terms of how many facilities had issues um, during uh, the winter storm in 2021, how many had issues in, in uh, early 2022, um, and then uh, uh, coordinating that and looking at those facilities that had issues again in, 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 in this winter season and doing outreach with them and, and doing comparatives to see if, there's, if there were similar issues. That's somewhat, somewhat related to Senate Bill 3 um, in, in terms of, of the requirements for the EPP, but there is, there is um, also a delta in that uh, these requirements require a, uh, an event with a power outage of, of greater than 24 hours. So for Winter Storm Elliott, there were not many areas of, of the state that experienced um, that kind of issue here. And so uh, the outreach um, has been a little bit different for those facilities in terms of winterization. So that's in, uh, enforcement and compliance. And so as, as we look forward, we'll continue through that, through that timeline and that phase and um, uh, can provide uh, updates. And of course, cases will be coming before you um, uh, in this process. As well, uh, during Senate Bill 3, uh, the Texas Energy Reliability Council was formed, uh, to which we are a, a member of, of that council. And um, yeah, we participate in those meetings and, and provide uh, that council um, with updates on our agency activities. And, and of course, that council provides a forum for interagency cooperation, and we're heavily involved in that, um, especially with Railroad Commission on, on uh, uh, oil and gas facilities uh, that supply uh, uh, fuel for our infrastructure. Happy to take any questions. I don't think I have any. Um, colleagues, any questions? Uh, just one, and um, you know, I'm going to do the worst thing to y'all. I'm going to ask a hypothetical. <laughs> I know you don't always love addressing hypotheticals, and this might be hard to answer and so if you don't want to answer it here and now that's fine just think on it and we'll we can chat but what I would ask is um, you know say there were no there was no law in place there was no SB3 that said here's what you have to do but instead there was you know just a framework a guidance document and y'all could do what you want you could you could set up um, what you think needs to be required for public water systems to make sure that, you know, we don't have another, uh, a lot of significant water outages because of another winter storm. So I'm just curious to know um, what, if, if you were king or queen for a day, what you would put into practice and what you would require outside of what SB3 says. And again, if you don't want to answer that right now, we can, we can chat later. But I just want to make sure we're the experts on this, right? And the ledge looks to us to be the experts on it. And so if there's something that isn't in the law that maybe needs to be required, in our opinion, I'm, I'm interested to know that because I think it's our job to communicate that to the ledge. Um, you know, not to tell them they did anything wrong, but just to communicate with them. And so if there are things that would be, whether it's helpful or just things that you and your practice being the expert on it would have set up differently, maybe? That's what I'm curious to know about. So you can speak to it now, or we can speak to it later, but it would, I would ask sooner rather than later because, you know, the ledge is meeting now, and I, I don't want to miss the opportunity of us getting to this summer and, uh, you know, whether it's 
through the rule proposal or whatever the next steps might be, it was something coming to light and we realize, oh, it, we need that in statute. So that's my hypothetical ask. <laughs> and if you have thoughts, please share. You're not tattletaling. You're just telling us what we need to know. Sure. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a stab at it. First and foremost, you have to remember that Senate Bill 3 really just addresses the power failure, okay? I think the fact that we did an after action review after Winter Storm Uri was very helpful because we addressed a lot of the weatherization issues that we saw. You know, you had so many different problems that occurred over that week that you know, power exacerbated, but you still had the, the infrastructure issues that regardless, uh, power couldn't have helped. Um, so I certainly think the development of our rules for this new rule package is going to incorporate a lot of those recommendations. Uh, we'll be a little bit more stringent on weatherization while trying to be as flexible as we potentially possibly can. Um, I think that we've really made a, um, as Brent said, a Herculean effort to make sure that these plans are comprehensive. Um, there are still a lot of obstacles within the plans um, that we're running into. Uh, whether or not it's a legislative fix, that's yet to be seen. Um, but certainly I think um, staff are spending a lot of time in interacting with the affected utilities to make sure that those plans are comprehensive and we have the documentation that we need to know that they'll be effective. So I certainly think we're on the right path and looking at it more from a holistic standpoint instead of just typically what we did before URI was for flooding. Um, we entered a whole new ball game after URI. And so again, taking a very holistic approach um, has been very critical for us, uh, particularly with our staff and our both offices to make sure those plans are very comprehensive. That's great. And you know, if I had to guess, that's probably the answer to my question, right? It's that we learned some stuff, but we're gonna be, I'm paraphrasing, so if I said this wrong, correct me, but we'll be able to address our concerns maybe through our rulemaking. But I would just say, you know, again, if something does come up, I don't, I don't care if it's last minute, what I don't ever want to happen, and when I say last minute, I mean last minute while the legislature's meeting. Um, I just don't ever want it to happen to where, you know, God forbid something, another, whether it's a winter storm or just another uh, horrible mother nature disaster happens and our agency is called downtown and we start, you know, having to answer questions about why didn't we enforce someone's EPP or I, 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 don't, I don't know. What I don't ever want our answer to be is, well, we didn't think we had the, we didn't think the legislature gave us the discretion to do that or gave us the capability to do that. I just want to make sure we have all the tools we think we need because if we don't, I don't want the legislature to look at us and go, we didn't know that. We thought we gave it to you in SB3 or, you know, whatever. So that's really what I'm getting at. I'm just trying to think further down the line of, I don't ever want our answer to allege to have to be, well, we couldn't do that because the, the bill didn't allow for it and then to go, come again? <laughs> we thought we gave it to you. So if there's something needed, let me know. Otherwise, you know, it sounds like we'll be able to address hopefully everything we'd want to address through rulemaking, which is great. And, you know, that's typically the issue with us. Um, when we have to effectively uh, implement something, uh, a bill without the ability to do rule writing prior to that, and so a lot of clarification and communication happens during that process to give affected utilities what they need to know um, in order to get their plans done. And so, I, if anything, I think that's been a hindrance is that they've not gotten everything that they needed through the legislation. We've had to do a lot of that through guidance meetings and just interacting with them on a one 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 So certainly the ability for us to draft rules, provide that clarification, is helpful um, when something like this occurs and affects pretty much every utility statewide. Thanks. I, I appreciate that point, uh, those questions you raised, Emily, and I want to add and make very explicit a particular type of that question, and that's, that's if and when it becomes apparent to y'all that a problem, instead of new factors, new things that are needed to come into the conversation, instead it's just simply resource adequacy. We've, we've identified the problems, we've identified the low hanging fruit, we see where the changes could be made, but those entities simply don't have the money, the resources, and they're requesting flexibility for us to implement in such a time frame or in such a manner that the public won't realize the benefits of that in nearly in time 
that too, for I think, falls on us to acknowledge and raise the flag. And it's a very delicate tightrope to walk to ask the legislature and ask the state for money. And I don't want to suggest that our agency ever steps in between local governments or entities that need resources from the state. But when they are conducting activities that fall under our purview, on, on, I, I don't think that we're necessarily asking on their behalf so much as it falls to us as the technical and regulatory experts to acknowledge this will get done in a far longer period of time than if this gets done with additional resources. And, and we can acknowledge that and we're having to consider flexibility directly on that point. I think that we will need to find a way to articulate that ask and endorse the ask if it comes to the, the water community, as I, I think there is. There's a, a widespread groundswell of, of water. Water is the issue this session. And so I, I will look to you all for where we can plug our voice in as that need materializes, metastasizes through this point, touch point with our agency. If I may add in, does this mic work? If I may add in as well. Um, I'm not so, hearing it. Not so well. <laughs> Two mics dead. If I may add in on, on a couple points with respect to just the events yesterday. So I think our state, of, our state yesterday experienced pretty much every kind of weather and natural catastrophe that we could experience except for a seismic or volcanic event. Um, and so uh, that tells you uh, how large Texas is and, and the scope and scale of the problems that we have to face. With respect to water systems coming out of these types of disaster events, uh, take, taking URI as, 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 the, as the cut point, uh, where we had over 3,000 water systems having issues across the state, compare that with uh, winter storm early 2022, where we had 19 systems had issues, and then with winter storm Elliott at the end of 2022, where we had about 216 water systems had issues there. Of those systems, we didn't have the issues that we had in URI with, with widespread electricity issues. And so but what we had were very cold temperatures. And so you had below ground issues with frozen pipes and leaking lines, and then above ground issues. And so there's no water system wants to go out. And every water system that experienced an issue or an outage will, will be doing their own after actions and, and taking their, their corrective action. But we as an agency, um, with, with these new rule changes coming before us, um, we'll, we'll have a bolstered presence as well. But we always have that presence after any disaster event. And we always work with these water systems in, in terms of our communication with them. and. And, and we've been working with those systems in terms of, well, what, what can we assist you with and what resources can we help guide to you in terms of, of what you may need for, for above ground weatherization and, and hardening? Um, and then the, the below ground, I'm not sure what, what, the, what the solution there is. That's just, it's just gonna be an issue. So I, I, I wanna put that out there and some of that data out for you in terms of what we saw coming out of Winter Storm Elliott this year with those 216 systems, 35% had, had the below ground pipe and water issues. 13% uh, had outages related um, to, to, to systems that were supplying them water. 5% had electrical issues. Um, and then there's 46%, which, which we're still digging into to, to find the cause. And so that just gives you a percentage uh, uh, cut, cut point for the, for the most recent um, winter storm issue. And I'd like to kind of uh, talk a little bit about what you had mentioned, Commissioner Janeka. Um, you know, what we were, we're really struggling is the implementation timelines. You're still having a lot of chain supply issues. You're having delivery delays. You know, we're now expecting colder weather, and so generators are hard to come by. Um, but also, you know, anything over two years that, that affected utilities are saying are going to you know, be able to implement. You've, you're talking about utilities that have putting in major infrastructure and going through those funding cycles to try to get money for that. Um, and so we're, we're trying to do our best with working with them to find alternative options while those long-term implementation plans are in place. The majority I'd say probably two to 3,000 utilities are planning implementation by the July one to one year to two years. We have less than 100 that are going beyond the two-year mark. And again, we're continually working with them to have alternative options in place in case an event occurs before that is implemented. 
And, and one other thing to consider in terms of water systems as well, um, and, and speaking with several water systems around the state, uh, most recently in Midland, they're struggling with the same issue that you talked about on the previous agenda item, which is vacancies and retention. And so th that's, that's, a, that's an issue not only um, for our agency, but also some of these utilities as well. And so just keep that in mind as well. Thank you. We could talk for hours about the <laughs> different challenges facing the thousands of water systems in Texas. And um, I propose that we continue the conversation, just not here today. <laughs> but I really appreciate um, the presentation. Colleagues, anything else? No, thank you all very much. Appreciate the presentation and the, and the discussion. Karen, Michelle, Craig, thank you. Um, no action is necessary on this item. Ms. Smith, when you're ready, please call the next items. Items 35 through 38 are for closed session, and the commission will not meet in closed session today. The time is 1121. We are adjourned. <laughs>